Alrighty, so I'd like to welcome you to our very first screencast for zoology. Um, we're going to be looking at chapter one, and the title of this chapter is Life, Biological Principles, and the Science of Zoology. Alright, so the very first thing you're going to notice on the screen is that we have the word zoology. So the definition for this word is the scientific study of animal life. Now one thing we need to keep in mind when we talk about zoology is that not only do we talk about things that we can see, but we also talk about things that we can't see. So if you look up here to the upper right, you're going to notice I have drawn something very unusual. And this is an amoeba. So an amoeba is a single cell creature that is super, super tiny, um, something that we really can't see with the naked eye, so we have to use a microscope. This particular animal does fit into this category. It is something that you would actually study in this class. Um, so you have to think about um, the, the concept of zoology as actually taking into account things maybe as large as a blue whale, but also things as tiny as an amoeba. All right, so modern zoology is derived from basically four things. We have physics, we have chemistry, we have genetics, and we also have evolution. Genetics and evolution, most people understand that those, of course, do belong um, in the um, area of zoology. We have to look at those to make um, a good understanding of the different phyla that we might study. Uh, chemistry also is something most people would um, probably understand that it does have its place in zoology. Um, if you think about atoms, of course, which make up molecules, which make up compounds, and of course we're made up of lots and lots of different compounds, um, would definitely have its place in zo. Now physics, on the other hand, is something that a lot of people have a hard time with because they're not quite sure how physics would play a part in zoology. So I want you guys to think about a bird. Now when you think about that bird, I want you to think about what that bird can do compared to all the other animals that we look at on this planet. That bird can fly. All right? Now in order for that bird to be able to fly, that bird must overcome the physics principle of gravity. All right. So to overcome gravity, it had to adapt. In other words, it had to develop characteristics which would allow it to overcome that principle. And to do that, it developed wings. And so definitely physics, in this case, had a major part in the development of birds. In other words, how they could actually adapt to their environment. So physics does have a part in zoology. Now down here at the bottom, you're going to notice it says, principles learned from the study of one group often pertain to other groups as well. So what that means basically is this. So when you study an amoeba, like the one you see right here, you can use um, different principles, different ideas, different things that you would learn with that group, and actually apply those to different um, other groups that you might uh, learn about in this class. And so when we talk about jellyfish, when we talk about sea cucumbers, when we talk about birds, um, there are some things you might have learned when we discussed amoebas that could be applied to that group as well. All right. All right. So we're going to go ahead and clear this and move on to our next slide. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the fundamental properties of life. Now, the first thing we have to look at is what is life. Now that can be a pretty big question. So basically no simple definition exists for life. All right. It says um, since what we have seen today is very different from what we have seen in the past and what we will see in the future, um, it's really hard to make a concrete definite definition for this um, this um, term. Uh, change over time, evolution has generated many unique living properties, and we're going to look at some of those properties in just a second. Uh, the definitions are based on complex reproductive processes that would exclude, and that's a really important word, exclude um, non-life. All right. So when we're making comparisons between things that are alive and things that are not alive, I want you to think about that. These reproductive processes we're going to talk about in just a second help to exclude those non-living things. All right. So the first property we're going to look at is chemical uniqueness. All right? Living systems demonstrate a unique and complex molecular organization when compared to non-living matter. All right? Small molecules now assemble into macromolecules, which obey the same physical laws as non-living molecules, but are definitely much more complex. Now, you guys have had this term in biology before. We have macromolecules. Macro means and most of you probably know this, means big. All right, so we have pretty big molecules here. Now, the four that we talked about in biology was nucleic acids, 
we talked about proteins, we talked about carbohydrates, and we definitely talked about lipids. Those are the four primary ones. Now they're macro because what we look at here is we look at um, smaller molecules like these that are connected together into long chains and that's what makes them all very very large all right now nucleic acids if you recall are things like DNA and we could talk about RNA in this category uh, proteins if you remember back to our discussion in biology on proteins we're talking about amino acids that are connected together in long chains like you see over here. And proteins are things that work in terms of structure. Um, you can think about proteins in terms of hormones, things like that in our body. Carbohydrates, the most common carb that we often talk about is glucose. And glucose um, is definitely there to um, provide us with energy. So it's a pretty important part or a pretty important macromolecule for living things. And lipids, of course, are fats. And fats are there to do lots of different things. You can think about fats in regards to hormones, just like we did with proteins. Um, you can also think about fats in terms of insulation. You know, those animals that live in extreme environments would need lots of fat. Um, you can also think about fats as being a way to store energy, long-term energy. So, so fats are pretty important. So chemical uniqueness, again, we have the same atoms. Maybe we have some of the same molecules. Um, but the way those things are put together are definitely different between living and non-living things. So these are the four primary ones that we would talk about. All right, so the next um, general property of living systems that we're going to look at is complexity and hierarchical organization. Now when we talk about complexity, obviously we have something that is very complex, maybe has lots of parts that, that put, are used to put it together. Um, when we talk about hierarchical organization, we talk about something where we have to put something in a particular order. Now, if you look right below this, it says living systems demonstrate a unique and complex hierarchical organization. In living systems, there exists an ascending order of complexity where each level has what we call an internal structure. All right. So looking down here at the table on the left-hand side, we have the ascending levels of organization that are discussed in your textbook. Um, macromolecules, which we just discussed, those would be the things like proteins, fats, carbs, and, and nucleic acids. Most of us know what a cell is, and of course the organism and populations and species. The internal structure for macromolecules would be maybe those atoms, maybe those molecules that are used to put those macromolecules together. When we talk about cells, we talk about little parts of maybe macromolecules that are used to produce maybe organelles. And so what you have to do here is you have to think back to your year in biology and think to yourself, you know, what's an organelle? Well, if you remember, organelles are those little organs of the cell. And those make up the cell and, of course, are super important to making sure that cell is able to maintain itself and to remain healthy. Now, when you think about an organism, of course, you know the organism is made up of cells, all right? And so that would be considered the internal structure. And those cells can actually be used to create tissues within the organism. Now when you think about populations, of course, you think about populations made up of a specific organi organism. All right. And when you think about a species, sometimes people have a harder time with this one, but there is a specific species that will make up basically a population, all right? So again, each of the ascendant levels you see on the left-hand side definitely have what we call an internal structure. Each level has unique abilities and requirements, all right? So we're going to go ahead and clear this one off and go on to our next general property. The next one we're going to look at is something called emergence, all right? Now for emergence, this one is something where you kind of have to take this word and think about what does it mean to emerge, all right? Well, it means to appear. All right? So the appearance of new characteristics at the next level of organization. It says these characteristics are what we call emergent properties. And these are a result of evolution at higher levels. Now table 1.1 down here at the bottom kind of gives you an idea of the different levels that we just talked about. Cell, organism, population, and of course species. Now it gives you a little bit of information here. It talks about time scale for reproduction, maybe fields of study. If you decide that you know cells are something that you're really interested in, you can go into cell biology. 
the way that you would study the cells, you would use microscopes, whether it's a light or an electron microscope, maybe a little bit of bi biochemistry would be thrown in there. But this is the one I want you to look at. Emergent properties. What have we gained from our study of cells? Chromosomal replication, synthesis of macromolecules. We've t learned about DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, polysaccharides. All of those are directly related to this level of organization. So those would be considered our emergent properties. And you can look at emergent properties for the level of organisms, the level of population, the level of species. There are certain things we've learned from our studies of each of those different levels. And so this would be considered a property of living systems. All right, so the next property we're going to look at is something called reproduction. Um, it is not necessary for individuals to reproduce. As we know, you can live a long, happy life without reproduction, without reproducing. But it is necessary for a lineage, or you could say a population, to survive. Life comes from previous life, but had to arise from non-living matter at least once. Now, what does this mean? Well, if you look down here at these different groups, we have genes, okay? Now, of course, we know the DNA that um, is found within our cells is sort of packaged into these genes. Now, these genes have to replicate, all right? I want you guys to think about mitosis. And remember, mitosis is simply one cell dividing into two. Now, before mitosis could occur, the DNA had to replicate. The genes had to replicate so you could pass that information on to the next organism. So genes do replicate, but they are not considered alive. So that would be part of what we call non-living matter. Now, cells, of course, will divide to produce new cells. Organisms can reproduce in two ways, sexually or asexually. Um, populations even can reproduce in, in, a, in a sort of a, an abstract way. They may fragment to produce new populations. So if you had a population over here of a certain type of bird, and for whatever reason, one of those birds got separated and is now here, if it's able to adapt and it's able to survive, maybe it could establish a population in this geographic area. So in a way, it is sort of like reproduction. And a species could even split to produce a new species, kind of the same way as populations. If this individual over here gets to be um, somewhat different, where it cannot breed with the members of this population, then it would be considered a new species. Alrighty. All right, so the next general property of living systems we're going to look at is the possession of a genetic program, like you see right here. And what this means basically is the structure of protein molecules are encoded in nucleic acids. Now remember, a nucleic acid was one of the four macromolecules we had discussed earlier. Um, an example of a nucleic acid, of course, is going to be DNA, could be RNA. But this is what holds the information necessary to pass um, our genetic program, or in other words, those codes that would determine what proteins need to be produced onto the next generation. Now, if you look at the second bullet here, sequence of nucleic bit nucleotide bases in DNA are going to determine the order of amino acids. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you remember what the bases were, we had adenine, we had cytosine, we had thymine, and we had guanine. All right, those were the four DNA um, nitrogen bases, or nucleotide bases. Now, the order that we have those in, let's see if we add a few more here, you're going to read those in triplets. And again, this was to produce protein. If you remember the phrase protein synthesis, the making of proteins. As we read this code, it's going to basically give us a particular amino acid, and we're going to put those amino acids in a certain order. And as we do that, that order is going to dictate a certain type of protein. All right, So that's how DNA is used. It helps to build those proteins. It helps to order those amino acids and give us the proteins that we need to be able to survive. So when people talk about a genetic code, it's basically the connection between the base sequences in DNA, like you see right up here, and the sequences of amino acids that you see here to produce the protein. All right. So the next general property of living systems we look at is called metabolism. Uh, living organisms maintain themselves by acquiring nutrients from the environment, 
and of course we all know that we have to obtain nutrients in order to survive. On the right hand side here we have a couple of examples. This is an amoeba um, and you can kind of see right here this is the food particle. It's extending what we call it pseudopods. It's um, sort of extensions of cytoplasm around the food um, particle right here. It's going to take it in, it's going to digest it. Down here, of course, a little bit more obvious. We have the chameleon sticking its long tongue out to grasp the insect on the flower that it has in front of them, in front of it. And so this is, again, another example of obtaining nutrients from its environment. Metabolic processes involve a range of chemical processes to break down nutrients. So it's great to take the nutrient in, but you have to be able to break it down as well. So when you break it down, what you do is your cells will perform cellular respiration. Now again, something that we learned in biology, um, it's basically pulling what we call the ATP out of those nutrients. And then once the ATP has been pulled out, the body can use that to synthesize any required molecules it might need to make sure the organism stays healthy. So most of these metabolic processes will occur again in specific organelles. Um, talking about cell respiration, the organelle um, important here would be the mitochondria. All right? And so that's just one example of an organelle that would be necessary to make sure that ATP gets to where it needs to go so we can create or synthesize those molecules that we need. All right, so the next property we look at is something called development. Uh, this involves changes an organism will undergo from origin to an adult. So origin might be a little bit um, unfamiliar. What we mean here is basically birth. All right, so birth to adult. It involves changes in size and shape and what we call differentiation within the organism. Now, differentiation is sort of exemplified on the right-hand side. So what we have here is we have a monarch um, butterfly that's emerging from its chrysalis. Now, of course, before it became a butterfly, this monarch was a caterpillar. And it hatched from its egg as a caterpillar. It spent a few weeks, um, obviously, gaining nutrients, taking in nutrients, growing, getting larger and larger. Then it went ahead and molted its last skin to produce this covering that you see right here called a chrysalis. Then over a period of a couple of weeks, um, the atoms, the molecules, the compounds, the structural components of that caterpillar were basically rearranged and you have what you see here. Um, we have the monarch butterfly that emerged from the chrysalis. And so that's a good example of what we call differentiation. In other words, things did change. Um, obviously, when you talk about insects, sometimes they're going to use the word metamorphosis. Um, same idea, it's going to metamorphosize or it's going to change to something brand new. Now, among animals, early stages of related organisms tend to be more similar um, between birth and adult. So typically, in, in those animals that are maybe a little bit more complex, we see maybe a change in size, maybe a little bit of a change in appearance, but it's not as drastic as you would see here with the caterpillar and, and the butterfly. <clears throat> so the next property we look at is something called environmental interaction. And all organisms will respond to their environmental stimuli um, by basically becoming what we call irritated, all right? It's kind of like if you have a class of students and you're in the process of teaching and you have that one student who just will not stop talking. So the teacher becomes a little bit irritated. It's the same thing for, for living systems. This is a property that actually will define whether or not something is considered alive. So a stimulus that you would find in the environment will cause a reaction of some sort from that organism. We cannot separate life in its evolutionary lineage from its environment. In other words, you can't tear the two apart. Environment has a big influence on um, where that animal came from. So a good example we see down here is we see the lizard here um, buried itself in the sand. Maybe um, it's, it's the morning, it's trying to stay warm. The sand tends to take in that radiant heat, maybe from the day before. And so it's keeping warm while it's still kind of cool outside. Now, maybe during the afternoon, Midday, the sun gets way too hot. So again, these are cold-blooded animals, so the environment determines its body temperature. Maybe it needs to find shelter under the rock so it doesn't get too hot, so the temperature doesn't rise too much. And maybe late afternoon is the perfect time for this lizard. 
um, temperature is about right, the radiant energy from the sun is about right, so it's actually going to come out and again take in that radiant energy to help bring its body temperature up to a point where it can perform important metabolic processes. All right, so the last one we're going to look at here is something called movement, and this is actually considered a property of living systems. Um, in some textbooks, they might leave this one out, but if you look here, energy extracted from the environment permits living systems to initiate what we call controlled movements. All right, these movements are essential for reproduction, for growth, for response to stimuli, of course, and for development. Now again, these movements could be something that we could see with our naked eye, um, or it could be something kind of happening in the background. You know, if you think about mitosis for cell division, we don't see that necessarily happening, but we know it, it happens. And things have to be rearranged or move around for that to occur. Animals are adapted for locomotion, which has led to dispersal of entire populations from geographic location to another over time. So this is a more obvious um, example of of movement and how it pertains to um, sort of geographic rearrangement of populations on our planet. Movement of non-living matter, and I think this one is probably the most important bullet on this slide, is controlled by external forces and thus is dissimilar to purposeful movements exhibited by living systems. So for example, if you take this battery that I have right here, if I sit it on my desk, I have to physically go in and push it in order for it to move, right? That is an example of a non-living thing. External forces are used to move that battery. When it comes down to living uh, matter, when it comes down to living things, you don't necessarily have to rely on an external force to get movement to occur. So this is considered a general property of living systems. All right, so that's going to take care of um, chapter one, this first screencast. So thank you guys for listening. And um, again, if there was an assignment attached to this um, particular screencast, please make sure that you have this completed before you come to class.